Number one is strawberries. No, I'm not kidding. I'm as serious as I can be. We're talking about five ways to mitigate the trauma that we still experience from childhood trauma. I call it residual trauma. It's staying with me, and I got to tell you at the very onset that my voice is a little bit uh, raspy, so I apologize for that. But hey, you can hear me, I can talk. So let's, uh, let's look at this because these principles are very important. So strawberries can help you uh, mitigate or alleviate the traumatic pain that you're still feeling from experiences in childhood. How can strawberries do that? Well, here's, here's how this works. Now, I mentioned this in another video, but we're going to unpack it in just a little bit more detail. But there were a couple researchers, a couple psychologists, Naomi Eisenberger and Matthew Lieberman. And they got 13 volunteers, UCLA undergraduate students. And they wanted to study their reaction to being rejected. But they didn't tell them that. They just told them that we're going to play this little video game. And all you got to do is toss the ball back and forth to two other people. Do you remember I was talking about this in a previous video? All right. So they did it. These 13 uh, undergraduate students, I was going to call them kids, but uh, you know, they're probably in their 20s, no longer kids, young people. And um, the first of three sessions, the first round, let's call it, they were told that there was a malfunction, so they had to just sit back and watch. The other two people passed the ball back and forth. Well, what they were really doing is they were observing these students as they were excluded, but not by design. It was a malfunction. So just sit and watch the other two kids play or whoever, other two participants. And uh, then it was fixed. Okay, second round, they, they participated. They, sometimes they would get the ball tossed to them. Sometimes then they would have to choose to toss it to one or two of the others. It was a computer. There were no two others, but they didn't know that. So how would they respond? All right, third round. They're going back playing again. But about two-thirds of the way through the third round, the other two players just tossed the ball back and forth. Just totally ignored them. Now, all the while, their brain is being examined by an fMRI, functional MRI, magnetic Resonance imaging, if I remember what MRI stands for. So they're seeing what's going on with their brain when they think they are intentionally being omitted, being rejected, going through those experiences that you and I went through when we were kids. The traumatic experience. Well, now they're going through it. And here's what they discovered. That a part of the brain lit up. It's called the anterior cingulate. That is the part of the brain that lights up. I mean, it doesn't literally light up, but figuratively speaking, that is the part of the brain that lights up when we experience physical pain. So our brain, and you may remember us talking about this a couple of days ago, but our brain interprets or experiences, I should say, emotional pain the same way it experiences or interprets physical pain. So what alleviates physical pain should alleviate emotional pain. Now let's make this full circle. What alleviates physical pain? Strawberries. Yeah, seriously. There have been studies that show the strawberries, uh, or I heard this from uh, Michael Greger, freeze-dried strawberry powder versus a fake strawberry flavored and colored placebo powder and compared to placebo the real strawberries significantly decreased constant pain intermittent pain and total knee pain and improved disability and overall quality of life in the uh, podcast effective or more effective than tylenol and yeah there is something in strawberries that makes them more effective. It's called P3G. And I'm not going to tell you what P3G stands for because I can't pronounce it. But believe me, the P3G is in strawberries. 
and it is an important anti-inflammatory property. In other words, it eases pain. So if you're having a headache, go for the Tylenol. Can if you want, that's up to you. I'm going for the strawberries. Now, after I watched that podcast with Michael Greger, and I'm not a big fan of Michael Greger because he's one of these uh, vegans, and uh, it's kind of like uh, confirmation bias, you know. Uh, they want to prove that the vegan lifestyle is ideal, so they think backwards, they start with a conclusion. I'm not making an accusation, I'm just saying people who are vegans or carnivores who give advice, I usually, eh, with a grain of salt. But that's beside the point. I listened to his podcast. You know what I did? I bought, went to Amazon.com, and I brought, I bought rather strawberry freeze-dried powder, freeze-dried strawberries in powder form. And I went to Kroger's grocery store, and I bought strawberries. And I eat five or six every day. And guess what? It seems to work. Now, I have a problem with my shoulders, but they're uh, painful. I mean, they hurt. Rotator cuff tears, on both sides. Had an operation on one, and the surgeon said, hey, we can't fix this. So I'm stuck with it for life. And when I started eating strawberries, it seems maybe it's psychological. Maybe it's the uh, placebo effect, placebo effect, excuse me. But I don't care. If it works, it works. But I don't think it's placebo. I think, uh, you know, I think the P3G is actually working. So, you've got trauma, residual trauma, today from childhood trauma, hasn't gone away. I mean, that one few, that one instance, that one experience, few seconds, maybe a few minutes, maybe longer of bullying, has lasted a lifetime. I mean, decades. The kids who bullied you, they forgot about it within seconds. Maybe minutes, best case scenario. You, still there. How do I know that? I went through it myself. Strawberries seems to help alleviate that in my mind. Not just strawberries, but any painkiller, but I prefer natural. Because I think it's better for you. So number one is strawberries. Go ahead and mark that one down. Number two is self-talk. The guy's name is Robert J. Lifton. I've mentioned him in the past, and I will mention him in the future because he's a very intelligent, very well-studied individual, and he's probably 100 years old, maybe older. So he's, uh, I'm a kid. I mean, he was a full-grown adult, middle age when I was born. You know, I'm 70. So... He wrote a book, kind of a long title, but Thought Reform and the Psychology of Totalism, a study of brainwashing in China. And he would bring in individuals who were brainwashed in China. And I hate to say pick their brain, but he would uh, do some research and interview these people. But he wanted to know what processes the Chinese used to successfully brainwash these people. To convince them that they did things that were wrong, they didn't even do. Here's what they did. And we can learn from this because, I hate to say it, but we do the same thing to ourselves. We are brainwashing ourselves. All right. So what he learned from these people who had been brainwashed is they would put them in prison for something they didn't do. They would put them in a cell, a crowded cell, with a bunch of other people who agreed with the facilitators that they were guilty, even though they weren't guilty. And then the victims would be taken before the facilitator and they would be accused of whatever and they were ordered to confess. Not that they're not going to confess. Well, actually they did because they would make life so miserable for them before they were brought in and asked to confess that they had a bargaining chip. So they wouldn't have access to restrooms, they wouldn't have a blanket on cold nights. They would be chained, and they would be painfully treated by those chains, and people would reject them, and it was just horrible. And then they'd go before the facilitator, and they said, tell you what, if you'll just confess to this, whatever. Confess to the sin, confess to this crime, confess to being uh, whatever you were, 
will alleviate the pain. We'll take off the chains, we'll give you a blanket, let you go to the bathroom. We'll tell these people to back off, stop uh, bullying you in the, you know, in the cell. And what would you do? Same thing these people did. Okay, I'll confess. I don't believe it, but I'll confess just so I can get a blanket, you know, just so I can go to the bathroom. So they would confess. Cool. And all was well. They'd go back to the cell. They were treated better. They had a blanket. They could go to the bathroom. No more chains. Then, uh, after a period of time, maybe days, maybe weeks, the facilitator would bring them back in. I need more confession. What you said earlier just was not sufficient. And again, the chains, no blanket, no bathroom, bowling. And they're told, if you just confess a little more thoroughly this time, we'll take away all that and we'll let you get back to being comfortable. All right, so this would happen over and over and over again. And it would go on for sometimes as long as three years. Why? Because they knew, the psychologist in China, the bad guys, they knew that if you could get someone to repeat a confession over and over and over again, eventually their brain would convince themselves that they actually did these things. Uh, there is an ethos of confession because if somebody is kept confessing, you can, can, you can achieve control of the his or her guilt and shame mechanisms. And there's no greater control that one can achieve over another human being. That's why they call it brainwashing. They're washing away realism and replacing realism with a lie. And the lie becomes reality. Do not ever, please, do not ever. Someone tells you to confess your sins of some social injustice, whatever. They're brainwashing you. Just don't do it. Don't be, don't allow yourselves to be fooled. That's a little bit off topic. But we are the facilitator. We're living in the prison of our minds. We're bringing ourselves before ourselves. And we're bringing up these allegations of trauma. And we're reliving it over and over and over again. And it just doesn't go away. We're brainwashing ourselves. We don't realize it. Negative thoughts. How do you stop negative thoughts? Well, to find out. I did what every thinking person would do, and I went to the internet. This is a government site in Australia called healthdirect.gov.au. And number two is self-talk. There's no communist facilitator talking to us. Well, who is talking to us? Well, we're talking to ourselves. I mean, we may still, as adults, be experiencing bullying and rejection. Um, I don't know about you, but I know I am. I'm autistic. It's part of life. I understand that. But I still don't have to brainwash myself. I can get rid of the negative self-talk. Here are some of the tips that you use. Number one is be aware of what you're saying to yourself. Be conscious of the fact that it's negative self-talk. You know, I love to run. I love to jog. I love to walk. And when I'm walking and jogging, I don't wear earphones, I don't listen to podcasts, I do that other times. I like to think, and sometimes my thoughts will wander into the negative territory. I just kind of wander into a Chinese prison and start talking to myself these negative thoughts. And i got to catch myself and stop myself and say, stop doing that. Be aware of what you're thinking. Another thing, another idea regarding negative self-talk is to challenge those thoughts. I mean, yeah, it was bad, but was it that bad? So you had these bullies when you were a child and they were putting you through this trauma and now you're still doing it to yourself and sometimes you're making it out to be worse than it really was. In other words, you're the bully, bullying yourself by going over this. I mean, the bullies again, you know, like we said. Maybe a minute or two after they bullied you or traumatized you, they forgot about it. And here we are 10, 20, 30, 40 years later with me, and it's longer than that. And we're still reliving these thoughts. They forgot about it. We're still living them. We're still bullying ourselves. The bullying continues inside our heads. So challenge those thoughts. Put them into perspective, saying, so what, which is what they recommend. I think that may be a little bit overboard because we don't want to 
be dismissive. We don't want to say there was no pain. Yes, there was pain. And there still is pain. And there still is trauma. We don't want to be dismissive, but we do want to put those thoughts into perspective. So, say put them into perspective. I guess that's the best thing you can say. Realistic. Realism perspective. The fact of the matter is the trauma hood, trauma childhood bully, they're gone. They live in our heads. We bring them back to life. They're zombies. A lot of these people physically get old as I am. Physically, they're dead. And it's not that they don't remember. They're dead. I remember. I keep these people alive. So what I need to do is put this into perspective. They're gone. They're dead, some of them. That happened. I'm not going to deny it. It hurt then. It hurts now. I'm not going to deny it, but I am going to put it into perspective. Does it really matter at this point in time? And will it matter in the future? So you just need to put it in perspective. You need to stop the thinking process. You need to stop the thought. And you need to replace those negative thoughts with, I don't like the term positive thinking. I prefer realistic thinking. Whether it's positive or negative, whatever it is, I want to be realistic. I don't want to be uh, delusional. So what are the benefits of what they call positive thinking? I call realistic thinking. Let's just go through these kind of quickly. And even though we're touching on them kind of quickly, hey, they're still important. Uh, number one, it improves self-esteem, stress management. Uh, the second thing is reduces symptoms, you know, things like depression, anxiety, personality disorders that come from reliving those thoughts over and over again. Rumination is what they call that. Improve your body image, maybe. Um, reduce your risk of self-harm. Make you feel more in control of your life. Stop and think about that for a second, would you please? Don't allow your thoughts to control you. You control your thoughts. How hard is that? And maybe harder than it sounds when you say it, but I don't think it's that hard. I'm going to be in control of my brain. I'm going to be in control of my thoughts. I just make that decision. You know, I'm not going to think that way anymore. By the way, that's the strategy I use to lose um, well over 100 pounds. Now, I'm not going to let my impulses control me. I'm going to control my impulses. Same thing. So this time we're not losing physical weight. We're not losing belly fat. We're losing traumatic weight. Yeah, it's a weight. It's a burden that we carry around. I'm trying to think of some things you'd carry around. Would you carry around a cinder block? You know, kind of like the blanket uh, when you're... Uh, did you have a security blanket when you were a kid? I didn't. I had stuffed toys. I had a monkey. Where I went, the monkey went. But, okay, I'm grown up now. I'm not carrying around that monkey. You're grown up now. You're not carrying the security blanket. And you're certainly not carrying around a cinder block. Are you? Maybe we are. Maybe those traumatic thoughts. And again, don't be dismissive. I'm not saying that. Don't say they didn't happen. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying don't exaggerate it to where it becomes a burden, an unnecessary burden. Number three is this. Relive it. Relive the experience. Now, I'm speaking this from my experience because this works for me. I don't know if it works for you or not. You'll have to make that decision yourself. But according to PubMed.gov, framing one's life story solely around the traumatic experiences leads to a feeling of persistent trauma and distress. I think we kind of said that before. We're reliving it. You know, we are doing it to ourselves. All right. But how do we confront it by reliving it? Well, here's what I did. Uh, maybe a year or so ago, I mentioned this. But I reached a particular milestone, financial milestone in my life. So I checked off that box. And to celebrate, reward myself, I bought a Corvette. I still got it. I, I, I don't want to say I love my Corvette, but uh, yeah, I do. I like my Corvette, put it that way. So I got my Corvette. I drove to my childhood home, place where I grew up. Lived there 16 years. 
and I parked in front of the house. What am I doing? I'm reliving a memory. Got out of my car and I walked two blocks to school. The school I attended for about, about eight years, seven, eight years. And I went out and I stood what is now a parking lot, but used to be, yeah, it was a parking lot, but we used it for a uh, softball field. And I stood at home plate where home plate used to be. I never got a congratulations. Congratulation or congratulations when I was a kid because I, I could hit the ball. I just couldn't. You know, I get to first base, about it. But, yeah, I just congratulated myself. I'm, I hit a home run. Not literally, but, you know, I had this financial goal. I obtained it. Got my Corvette. All was well. So I'm reliving the experience. I'm replacing the old experience with a new experience. Okay, the old experience is still there, but it's now being trumped by a new experience. Diminish the old experience. I don't want to lose the memory of it. I want it to stay there because it does have value. But I'm reliving it. I'm confronting it. I literally, literally went to the place and confronted it. That type of reliving, I think, can be very beneficial. It can be very therapeutic. Number four is surround yourself with empathy. Now, I would like to say surround yourself with empathetic people. Good luck finding them, because people, they don't understand unless they've been there, and sometimes even then they don't want to understand. But they have a point of reference, and if they have not experienced your experience, they don't have that point of reference. You know the old saying about, walk a mile in my shoes, or jog a mile in my shoes. I like to wear jogging shoes. It's hard to find those people. So I'd like to say surround yourself with those people. I think you'd be fortunate to find one or two. But if you can find them, and if they're not scamsters, you know, bromance scammers or romance scammers, got to be careful. Those are people to hang out with. Now, I went to the Internet because I love to research this stuff before I make a video. And I went to the Internet, and I thought, okay, I'm going to find out where to find people who are empathetic. And so I typed in the search terms, and what came up was... How to be empathetic. That's not what I wanted. I wanted to find people who already are empathetic that I can expose myself to and expose them to me and, you know, have that camaraderie. So I tried another search term and it kept coming up. How to be empathetic. Apparently, there just aren't that many people who are empathetic that we can surround ourselves with. But still, we can still be exposed to or expose ourselves to would be a better way to say it. Empathy, empathetic people. Books, do you like to read books? I don't because my mind wanders, you know. Um, I will read half of the first paragraph and even though my eyes are looking at the words, I'm thinking about something else. But I can listen to podcasts, which is what you're doing at this very moment, come to think of it. So I'm surrounding myself with empathy by listening to people on the internet who have experienced and are still experiencing autism. And I'm being encouraged by their empathy. And by the way, that's the whole point of this YouTube channel is to be empathetic toward people who have gone through and still going through what I went through and still going through. So we can encourage one another, be helpful for one another. So a podcast is one way to do it. So surround yourself with empathy by whatever means. People who understand you. Not easy, but something that uh, we need to work toward. Then finally, number five is uh, therapist. Go to therapy. Now i got to tell you that I've seen one therapist in my entire life. Well, two, actually. But as far as you know, going back, seeing them multiple times, one therapist. And I got to tell you, it was a very good therapist. The reason I went is I thought I was autistic, thought I had Asperger's syndrome. And so I sought out somebody who did nothing but Asperger's or autism. And I found that person, very fortunate to have found her. And she was very helpful, very beneficial. Unfortunately, not all therapists are like that word of warning. Have you ever gone to a physical therapist? And they try to get you to keep coming back. Why is that? You know, I'm there to get healed. 
<laughs> I'm there to get fixed. They want me to come back so they can charge me. So it's about them, it's not about me. So they would say, okay, now the next step is, and they never get it, come to an end of the steps. And the same thing true with some um, chiropractors. They, they want you to keep coming back forever and ever. And it, I didn't come there for that. I came there to get fixed. And some therapist will continue to have you coming back for more and more therapy so they can get paid. And you will be healed when your insurance runs out. And they can't charge anymore. And then, then poof, ah, we solved your problem. Now, not all therapists are like that. Not all physical therapists. Not all uh, mental, shall we call them, psychological therapists. Not all chiropractors do that. But it's fairly common. I mean, these are pros. They do things like that. Some, well, a lot of them do things like this. So therapy. So there are five strategies to deal with childhood trauma that you're still, still experiencing. These are things that I am doing or have done, and I hope I've been an encouragement to you and a help. And if I have, well, then you're invited to join our family by subscribing to this YouTube channel. And if you think it deserves it, this video, give it a thumbs up. If you had a thought pop in your head while we were talking, uh, that's why we have a comment section. So tell us what's on your mind and uh, maybe launch a conversation with some others. That would be helpful. And if you don't mind, you can help us by sharing this video on Facebook, on Twitter, now X or whatever social media. Thanks for stopping by. We really genuinely appreciate it. Always a joy, a privilege to uh, have so many people participate in these uh, YouTube podcasts. So thanks for stopping by.